everyone. I'm Krzysiek uh, and I will be you know, trying to introduce you to the topic of uh, time series forecasting. Uh, so as Przemek mentioned, uh, I'm a software engineer at the Unidate and just two disclaimers at the beginning. So I'm not an expert in the area, but I will just be trying to you know, share what I've learned. And also that's my first you know, public meetup presentation, so beware. And so the agenda of today will be that I will introduce a couple of topics in the time series and then we will just you know go through the classical statistical methods of forecasting we will see some you know benchmarking methods and we will try to combine those methods we will see some new ap approaches to the you know uh, time series forecasting at scale from Uber, Amazon and Facebook and we will wrap up with some time series tech landscape and some conclusions at the end uh, so, when we speak about you know time series, what are the examples? Actually, the time series are everywhere. It can be like a sales sales uh, of a product over time. It can be you know a price of uh, of stock of a on a company on the market, uh, and also it, it it can be like a, for example you know uh, electricity uh, production in some country. And so why time series forecasting is important? I think it is important and from my experience in many industries, for example, companies need to you know, forecast sales or profit in order to allocate their budgets. They need to you know, uh, forecast product de demand to prepare the stock in the warehouse in case of Amazon, for example. And the other examples like they need to predict the power or electricity demand in order to not overproduce or uh, underproduce because it, it can cause some issues and so when we speak about you know time series forecasting let's fo let's focus on the graph so we have like uh, in the blue we we have some time series you know some sales uh, va values in blue and then we have some fo forecast in orange and we, when we speak about the forecast we can speak about you know uh, a point for forecast so you know we predict the next element the the, the second next element, etc. Uh, so, the, so these are co called point forecasts. We can also speak about the horizon of the forecast. So either we, you know, only predict the next value, or we predict like three or six uh, values in advance. And also, one other topic is the residual. In, in this case, we we speak about the difference between what we predicted and what was the actual value of the time series. Uh, in case of time series, we can also think about, uh, I'll speak about prediction intervals. The prediction intervals is say, you know, we are not only interested in predicting uh, the point forecast, so the next value, we are also, you know, interested in saying that you know, with 95% of the probability, I can be sure that, you know, the value will be within this in interval. And also, it's nice that uh, this interval can be, you know, narrow enough, because if it's high, then it's not a very good forecasting. Also, when you will come up with some model for the time series forecasting, you don't want to only, you know, find the model that fits you know, best for example for the last three months of the data. Actually, what you want to do, you want to try, you know, test your model over time. So in in this case, let's have that we have the full he history, historical data of the time series. And what we do, we just go go into the past. Everything be between some chosen point in the past is treated as a training set, and everything in front is going to be forecasted. And in, and in order to test over time, we're just gonna do many such passes over the data with like sliding or expanding w window of this training set. Uh, next co concept in time series forecasting, it's, it's called seasonal trend decomposition. So the idea is that we have some you know, complex uh, signal on the input and actually to we can decompose it into some you know uh, sub signals and uh, just they describe uh, time series better 
So in classical terms, we can de de decompose the time series signal into like seasonal parts, so something that happens periodically, like for example, sales in December are always bigger because it's Christmas. Uh, the trend component, which is saying, you know, regardless of the seasonal ch changes, whether we are, our values are going up or, or down, and also the random or the level uh, component, which is, uh, which is just what's left when we, you know, decompose the seasonal and the trend components. And then in order to get, to get back the original signal, what we actually do, we just combine this, uh, all the components that we decomposed, and we can do this in two different manners, the additive, so just add those elements together time-wise, or to multiply them. And of course, uh, time series can be more complex, so the trend doesn't need to be so easy as in the previous example, it can change over time, so, so we can see in this data at the beginning that the trend is, is growing, growing up, and then it's going down. So when it comes to classical, you know, methods for, for forecasting time series, we can, you know, the statistical statisticians came up with, with a lot of the methods. We can say that it's a naive method. A naive method is just, you know, pretty the next value is going to be exactly wh what I had previously. And also other methods like ARIMA, exponential smoothing, theta, t bus, random walk, etc. But we will only, you know, uh, have a glimpse into ARIMA and exponential smoothing just to get an intuition how this method works. So when it comes to ARIMA, the ARIMA can actually be divided into three parts. And the intuition behind ARIMA is that, uh, you know, let's look p-values in the beginning that we had. And also let's look at the q residuals, so the q last errors that, that we've made in, in our forecasting. And also whenever the data you know, contains some seasonality or the, or the trend before trying to fit our data, we're gonna uh, differentiate it once or twice. Differentiating is just, you know, instead of trying to forecast the actual values of the time series, we'll, we will be working on, on, on the diffs between the s uh, subsequent values. And, that's, and so now when we look at the equation for the ARIMA uh, forecast, so in order to predict the value x at time t, so we just, you know, we can say that we have this autoregressive component which looks at the p, p last values of of, of this time series and assign some weights uh, to those values and order it looks at the last Q residuals, so the errors that we've made in the forecasting and also we assigned them a, a couple of weights and the idea here is that, you know, what, what are the weights? Actually, in ARIMA method they are fitted to over, over, the, over the training set. And so now, as we know that the ARIMA can be decomposed into autoregressive uh, part of order P, you know, integrated part of order D and moving average of order Q, you know, the question is how do we choose the PD and Q va values? So the classical method is to follow, you know, ARIMA modeling procedure, but maybe we can automate this. We can actually use uh, our forecast uh, library, which implements like auto ARIMA method and what auto ARIMA does simply is like it brute forces the search space of all these parameters uh, to find uh, the combination of these PD and Q values that optimizes on your data set given some information criteria metric. Uh, the next method is exponential smoothing and the intuition between the uh, of this method is even simpler than in ARIMA. Uh, so in this method, we're gonna look at the previous value and the actual, you know, our estimation of the previous value. And we're gonna mix them with some weights. And uh, so when we look at the, the equation, so in order to predict the value at time t plus one, we just gonna take, you know, the value at time t, uh, mix together with the pre prediction of, of, of the value at time t, and we're gonna mix them with the weights alpha and one minus alpha, 
and in this, this case this alpha is called smoothing coefficients that is either chosen by hand or fitted on the data set and here you here you can see how the exponential smoothing be, behaves on a, t on a typical uh, time series. Let's say in blue we have the actual signal and with, with the different colors we have uh, different exponential smoothing models with different uh, smoothing parameter alpha. And so, so, so we can see as, we, as the alpha grows we actually put more weight into the last value that occurred so actually if alpha equals one, the exponential smoothing is just the naive method, so that's just predict the, the previous one. Uh, so what I presented just is just very simple exponential smoothing, and this method is, is, is caused like that. But actually, I don't want to go into details in this presentation. The exponential smoothing is uh, a full fa family of the methods. Where you can, you know, aside of you know predicting the values, you can also introduce, as in a seasonal decomposition, the trend component, which is uh, which can either be uh, non-existing additive, additive dumped, and the seasonal component that can be non-existing additive and multiplicative. Some of these methods can there have their own names, uh, but yeah, the, the 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 family space is quite big. And so again, the same as with Arima, it comes down to the, how do you choose the model that, that you want. Either you follow the exponential smoothing modeling procedure, or you, you, you just want to automate that. And again, in the forecast library, we have the ETS function that simply you know, brute forces all the possi possible models and choose the one that best fits your data set. And studying all these statistical methods, you can come up with a natural question, you know, on average and in, in, in reality, which method is the best? Uh, so actually, the researchers all have done that and they organized, you know, a very old, you know, M3 competition in the year 2000, when they collected like 3,000 of the series from different uh, varieties of business, finance and economics with different seasonalities and different uh, time series lengths. On the right, there are the results, but uh, maybe not, uh, let's maybe not focus on them. Uh, the most important are the conclusions of this competition, and the conclusions are the following, that the complex methods like auto-arima are not necessarily better than the simpler ones, for, for example, the theta method or the naive method. This ranking can, uh, can, can vary, depending on which accuracy metric we're going to choose and you know how long the forecasting horizon we we're going to choose and also that you know pure machine learning and neural networks uh, models at this time were unable to to uh, to get comparable results so the natural question next is can we do better so last year they organized you know an m4 competition where the number of the time series were actually quite bigger and the main objective of this competition was you know as the machine learning and deep learning methods are gaining popularity and uh, get, get getting traction in uh, natural language processing e image recognition etc are they uh, superior in time series forecasting um, so we have the, the ranking again on the right, but maybe not, let's not focus on this. More important are the conclusions. So the conclusion is that the combination of methods is the king. Actually the best 12 out of 17 of the methods, of the best methods, were the combinations. And we will go into what combination of method is, but simply put, you know, you know build a lot of, you know, take a lot of statistical models and combine them together to get better prediction. Uh, the second conclusion is that there was a surprising winner, so there was a hybrid approach by Swavek Smil where he uh, merged exponential smoothing with LSTM ne network. And also the, the third conclusion is that you know, still you know, pure ML methods performed poorly, so if we really look at the table, uh, the best machine learning method is only on the 25th uh, place. And here, looking at the top six solutions, so uh, 
five of those are just you know different uh, combinations of the statistical and machine learning methods you know combined and uh, averaged together. So their results in the last columns are quite uh, comparable and the same. And actually, what's surprising is actually the uh, the, the the first solution from from Uber is just have a significant margin between the first. Uh, between the subsequent second solution. A nice thing about this competition is that all the methods were open source on GitHub, so you can go over the internet and, and, and take a look. And also they organized an M4 conference where they you know, pre presented the papers of all the, I think, top five uh, best uh, solution and they provided a presentation of in-depth explanation of those methods. So now what is the combination of the methods? So the main idea is pretty simple. So we're gonna you know, take a bunch of you know, different statistical um, models like auto-arima, exponential smoothing, naive theta, etc. Even we can choose some neural networks or linear regressions. And then in order to, pr to produce the, the forecast of this combination of methods, we're just gonna take the the forecast of all the methods and we're gonna combine them in some fashion in, in order to get this final uh, forecast. And, you know, what do we mean by the com combination? So, th this is how mostly these combination methods differ because we can combine differently. So we can just, you know, s uh, take it just a simple a average of those methods and this is actually the comp benchmark. Uh, that was like a that was like a baseline for this competition, and it was ranked at the place 19th. Uh, we can assign some uh, weights by the accuracy this metro this metrics got on the training set, and this was actually the first solution proposed by uh, Prologistica Soft, a company specializing in time series forecasting from Wroclaw. And also, the different approach is that actually you can learn those features using some regression method like uh, linear regression, random forest, or XGBoost, or even LS LSTM. And it was actually you know the the approach that the second solution uh, took. Uh, what what are the benefits of this approach, or why this method works? Um, mainly due to that we have the improved accuracy because we have additional, uh, additional information gain, yes? So these different uh, statistical models, you know, try to grasp different uh, patterns in this uh, time series, and just averaging between them adds additional in information to, to the full model. Uh, again, when we have mo multiple forecasters, we actually reduce the risk of a bad forecast, which is very, uh, important in practice because in in in, in many areas, uh, you, you know, people in charge they are less interested in whether you get one or two percent better on average. They are mostly better if you will reduce the long tail. So the 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 probability that you're gonna produce a bad uh, forecast. And actually, if if the if in combination method you're gonna use some uh, linear regression you know, random forest or XGBoost or this kind of methods, you can actually embed some uh, external data and external features uh, and not only uh, look at the previous values of the time series, right? And examples of such features are the day of the week, you know, the weather, special events or some expert knowledge. Uh, here, here is just, you know, a glimpse uh, because many of these methods were building uh, these weights uh, per, time, per time series, but maybe we could build just one model that, you know, regardless of the time series, will tell us, you know, what weights we should assign to the forecasters. And so the idea is that, uh, let's say we have a bunch of, you know, different time series, and somehow we will come up with some uh, features that can tell you know, this uh, actually, you know, depending on this feature, this feature, this feature, this time series is very similar in nature uh, to the other, yeah? 
And this actually is provided by the nice uh, TS features package in R. And this, uh, this actually this package provides lots of these uh, features that, that you can uh, that you can derive from a time series. Uh, so next, um, statistical methods work very well, but um, in general they are quite infeasible when you have like millions of time series, like in Uber or Amazon. Uh, mainly be because uh, it's easy to develop a model for a single time series, but it's difficult uh, to maintain like millions of different models per small time series. So, for example, in Uber, you know, let's say uh, the right demand in on in Kazimierz, so only a, a part of Krakow, or in in terms of Amazon. Uh, you know, uh, a demand on, on, on a single product out of millions. Also, these statistical methods require frequent retraining because their accuracy in general lowers as you increase the forecast horizon, so you need to uh, retrain very free frequently. And if you will think that you have uh, millions of such time series, it makes, uh, you know, this recomputing pipelines very complicated and difficult to uh, to maintain. Also, these methods do not benefit from cross-learning between the time series. So, for example, let's say that this time series is uh, s similar to the other. And so, maybe we could come up with a single mo model that predicts uh, the values for a different uh, time series at once. What would be the benefits of such models? It's maybe it will be difficult to train and get right at the beginning, but maybe it will be easier to maintain, from, for example, from an Amazon point of view. And it will allow this cross-learning and accommodate for a new time series. So, for example, let's say that new product appeared. We, we have just two data points for, for this product. And how, how are we going to uh, forecast? Now, mo moving to the winner of the M4 competition was a hybrid method of Swagex milk from Uber. So the idea or the intuition of this method is the following. So we're gonna learn separate you know, exponential smoothing method model per uh, each time series separately. And then we're gonna learn one global LSTM network that, that learns you know, all these um, all this uh, that learns on all all the type all the, all the series at once, yeah? and also it utilizes a nice idea of ensemble of specialists. So actually, we don't have like a one model; we choose a pool of models. For every mo model, we assign you know a random subset of the time series that on which this model is going to learn, and then the final forecast for a particular time series. Let's say that we the the number of models in the pool was seven. So the final forecast for every time series is, is going to be average uh, of the top, for example, two models that best performed for this time series. And so the data flow in this ESRNN model is going like that. So per time you have per time series para parameters you choose some global parameters like uh, smoothing coefficient, then you learn the exponential smoothing, which is learned per series, and then you get a vector not, not of the forecasts, like in uh, combination of methods, because, but you actually get the, the hidden state, the parameters behind the exponential smoothing. Then the idea, very important idea in his solution was the decisionalization and uh, adaptive normalization of the input before you know inputting this vector into LSTM uh, ne network and then at the end you need to re-season and de denormalize. Actually his solution was coded in C++ using Dynet but there are you know now open source solution in Python which I include at, at, at the end of this talk. The next emerging method is the Deep AR proposed by a a Amazon. It's also available as a service uh, via so-called the AWS forecast. This AWS forecast do uh, 
not only have this deep AR method, but also uh, like auto arima, exponential smoothing, profit, and a, a couple of others. It's definitely worth to try if your data is not very co very confidential, of, of, of course. There is some open source, again, implementation of these methods using PyTorch. And at least Amazon uh, says that they use it internally to forecast the demand on the product on Amazon.com page, and also the utilization of resources in their AWS uh, fleet. And so I'm not going into the details of this method, but just the highlights. So they trained like one global LSTM models on all of the time series. Uh, they are not predicting point forecast, but they are predicting the likelihood that uh, the, the, the value of the time series will be between A and B, so it will be between some interval. And uh, the next thing is that outside, you know, not they are feeding the LSTM model not only with 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 the previous value of the time series, but also with some covariants which are item dependent or time dependent. So we can come up uh, with the features like you know there was a promotion on this product or will be a promotion for this product or day of the week or there will be a holiday or 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 something like that. Um, what's the time? Okay, we, I, I think we have some time, so we can uh, speak a little bit about the uh, last method that I'm going to present. This is the pay Facebook Profit. It is not ML or DE planning method. It is a typical statistical forecasting procedure implemented in R in Python and open sourced. What this method provides, it provides completely automated forecast for the time series, but this forecast actually can be, you know, tuned by the analysts. So the model is more interpretable and you have more, you know, influence on, on, on the model e itself. They claim that it works best with a time series that have very strong seasonal effects and also, you know, highly depends on such events like holidays or Super Bowl in the US. And also, what ni nice thing is that they are robust to missing data. For example, let's say by some by some reason you don't have uh, two data points in the middle of the time series. Uh, in their original approach, statistical methods do not work like that. You either need to you know put them with zeros or somehow extrapolate or, or interpolate them. But uh, Facebook probably maybe in the in the in the roots makes the same thing. So what is the, this analyst in the loop concept? So actually the, the analyst can you know, set some upper limit on the time series saying that you know, this, this market size is like that. It, it can also specify some change points in the trend because he knows like for example, we gonna, um, we gonna discontinue uh, the support for this product in two weeks. So this will probably affect the model that it will be a trend change. And also he can input, you know, hand-coded holidays or special events. Uh, so wrapping up a little bit, what, are, what is the, you know, tech landscape in the time series? So I've mentioned already, you know, a lot of, you know, R, R libraries like Forecast. Forecast, there is also a li library HTS, which is for hierarchical time series forecasting. So you can imagine um, forecasting a sale of a company where you you know have global sales, then department sales, then the segment sales, etc. There is like also TS intermittent library where there are methods like Croston, which are good for forecasting things that happen rarely. So for example, let's say that you have an order for a, a product in this month and you have no order for the, in the subsequent uh, months like zero zero and then something and again zero zero again something so so very intermittent. Uh, traditional methods do p poorly with uh, such data, and you can have special uh, special methods for that. And there is also this TS features library. And when it comes to Python, we have the stats models. 
it's nice, but it's not so so great as an R uh, li library that you don't have the auto arima, you know, you don't have this automatic methods. You can have the actually you can use the R Py2 in order to run R from Python, but it actually sucks. Nowadays, that you know we have this emergence or re resurrection of you know machine learning and deep learning methods in forecasting. So most of, most of these. Uh, methods are implemented in Python because we have the libraries for neural networks like Part, PyTorch or TensorFlow. But that, but that's it. I, I would say it's worse than it is. It is in R. That's why at Unit Eight we've been starting to work on you know some nice uh, time series forecasting li library internally, which we probably gonna open source uh, soon. And so just wrapping up uh, the conclusions, so in my opinion, y you know, the classical methods are hard to beat when you have like sufficient history of the data. You have little in external information, like there is a promotion, there is a holiday, uh, etc. You and, and you have very few, un you have very few related time series. You can, s my recommendation it would be that you start with the classic and proceed with the with the combination of methods idea. Why? Because you would like to reduce the risk of a bad forecast, and also you have the uh, then uh, ability to incorporate you know some external features if they appear. Uh, I would recommend only experimenting with emerging you know machine learning and deep learning methods if you know what you, what you are doing. Uh, you have lots of so tens of thousands up to million uh, related time series and you want to cross learn be between them and you just want one or not very big number of the models. I just, I would say that the forecasting toolset is much better in R and a bit rusty in Python but let's see what happens in, in the coming years. And just out of the conclusions two tasks from me here, there will be definitely a blog post on our company page uh, that's summarizes for what was in the presentation. And the next, I think when I was preparing this presentation, I thought that maybe more hands-on workshop-like presentation would be much uh, better for the audience, but 45 minutes is quite, is quite short. I hope this presentation is going to be s like sent and the link to this presentation will be available to you because I gathered lots of you know interesting links uh, to the materials that are that that have very interesting look on the time series forecasting state of the art and you can learn a lot from that and also you can get inspiration from this material and see what what happens in the coming years. So thank you for your uh, attention. I hope it, it was I interesting for, for you. And just that, uh, something that if you want to work on such stuff, we are hiring at Unitate, <laughs> so feel free to apply. Thank you. Uh, so I think we have a couple of minutes for questions, if you have any. So, so the question was, what I was working on on any de dependent variables, depending on what you mean. So, of these external features, right? Or yeah. so definitely, you can have like uh, in many companies where you are working on sales forecasting, you can get uh, an indication, for example, that. Uh, this segment of the company is going to shrink or go down. That's that's one of the, the dependent or influential uh, variable. The other can be uh, in order to you know predict how many orders we are going to have. You can actually have a standing orders already at the company. So you, you say with high probability you, we already have you know standing orders for. Uh, products in five months, 
so with some probability uh, they are going to happen but this this was mostly it aside of of course of you know trying to mix into these models some kind of an econometric metrics like you know G gdp or you know metrics uh, de depending on on the domain on the industry which you are working okay so i have one more question because um, there are different types of phenomena in tension risk forecasting so for example uh, there are cycles that depend on the time of the day, so there is something happening in the middle of the day and not much something happening uh, during the night, and etc. But then uh, there are uh, events that uh, depend on the holidays, for example. So, uh, for example, there are holidays that uh, uh, have different dates within the year, uh, for example, um, Easter. And I'm wondering, uh, what do you suggest is the best strategy when we're dealing with uh, this sort of phenomena and, and building the, the model? If one should uh, just let the, the more sophisticated the model try to pick it up, or it's some data um, preparation required beforehand and skipping this, uh, the data points? So this is actually addressed by some blog posts by Uber. So initially they had uh, an approach that uh, they need to hand code these holidays and special events into the model, but it was uh, time consuming regardless of the number of the time series that they have. And you know, that you know, they operate globally on many markets. So, you know, there is like a random event, for example, in Tauron Arena in Krakow or, so, or something like that. And later on, uh, having all those millions of time series, they have been able to to make that the LSTM network will learn that on, on sufficiently large time series data. Uh, I don't, to be honest, I don't know the details of that, but if you have problems with that, maybe that's, that's the one uh, area where you can get an inspiration from. Because they published most of their work, at least inspirational ideas, of course, not the working solutions. So if there are no questions, or you wanna ask, so you, so you can ask me questions, I guess, afterwards on the networking session. But I guess now we're gonna have a break, and we're gonna return back with a nice presentation from Veronica. Thank you. Thank you.